there's some discomfort in learning? Is there some fundamental discomfort that comes with pursuing your goals if you have set lofty goals for yourself? Estamos en Concord, Massachusetts. Vamos a platicar con George Stewart, que es el director de la American School Foundation de Monterrey. Tiene una trayectoria eh, de académico muy, muy importante. Y él vive acá. Estamos eh, en el mes de julio, entonces se viene acá a pasar en su casa los veranos. Y vamos a ir a su casa a platicar. George Stewart, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Well, this really is appreciate fun. it. Yeah. I think this is the first time I've done a podcast. Really? Maybe ever, but yeah. certainly the first time in my backyard. Well, this is quite a backyard. <laughs> it's beautiful. So this is this is a park right here. Yeah, this is um it's referred to as as um conservation land. Yeah. And so uh Concord has a has a a policy or a, an investment in in farmland to keep farmland available to fa for farming rather okay. than building condominiums or houses on it and so so the town bought the land and put it in a trust and so they so local farmers can farm it um, they don't tend to farm this very often or they farm hay here um, but we've had we've had green beans and actually for a while the green beans which is the I don't like alas Oh, I, see. I uh, drove around. We had dinner here in Concord. It's beautiful. Yeah, uh, you were telling me a little bit about the history. I saw Ralph uh, Emerson uh, house. Yeah, yeah, Emerson. So he's a he's those, that group. That's that's um, Thoreau. Yeah. Henry David Thoreau, um, Emerson, um, uh, Louisa May Alcott, who did the who that yeah. from the Alcott. Yeah. The, the, the daughters, the sisters yeah. that made the movie. The, I think it's in Spanish, it's Las Muchachitas. Las Muchachitas, yeah, that right? the Little Woman, yeah. The little yeah, Women. Yeah. Uh, that, that actually was filmed. Mujercitas. Mujer, oh, is it Mujercitas? Muchachitas was a soap opera. Oh, the soap opera of the same thing? No. No, different. Very different, but it was very good. Uh -huh. <laughs> Completely different. Well, the, the set for that movie... We know, saw the house, yeah. Well, it's just over here. Yeah, we you saw it. You just go through the woods this yeah. way, and that was the set. They took it down. And we yeah. saw Emerson's house. And then I realized that's where Thoreau roomed with Emerson, right? Uh, yeah, well actually Emerson's parents uh, lived here and they lived in the house that's called the Old Manse okay. that overlooks the, the, the North Bridge, okay. which is where the Minutemen were on one side and the Redcoats uh -huh. from the other side. And then Paul Revere was trying to get over to, to warn everybody that the Redcoats were coming. So a very um, historical place. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to the U.S. independence. Yeah, those writers are called the, the and we refer to them as the transcendentalists. Yeah, yeah. A lot of his writing, I think even Civil Disobedience, so, was written yes. in, was written on the banks of that pond. If I remember correctly, and I may not, he just moved there to write and to think. Exactly, right? exactly. To be outside of civilization, which, I mean, it was, what year are we talking about? Well, this is, this is all um, 1800s. 1800s. Yeah. So I don't know what he was escaping because he didn't have a cell phone. He was escaping the city, I guess. Uh, yeah, no cell phones. Um, it's interesting. The um, I have a I'll, maybe I'll send you this photo. Yeah. That if you look at the context in which Emerson and Thoreau wrote, you know where that what their desk looked like, yeah. and, and um, you know, and and if you go to Thoreau's house, then there's a little dingy desk. It's very austere, mm -hmm. you know. It's no cushions. It's yeah. wooden, and um, and the idea was to live in a sort of totally minimalist yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting the irony of of choosing minimalist and having so many big ideas. Yeah. Right. 
it and allows them right? in some ways right you you filter out the noise in Emerson's case too in the old in the old manse you can see where he did a lot of his writing um, he pointed his desk at the wall so it looks beautiful outdoors because you could look through the windows he put he pointed at the wall so you can only focus and put and let and sort of let go of all the noise mm -hmm. and just so and just even think. the you know, beautiful landscape was a distraction. Well, that's sort of what I come, my yeah. conclusion. Um, Thoreau, perhaps different, but for Emerson, if you go look at his desk, it, it faces the wall and it's very small and there's no, he's trying to like shut out the world, it seemed like. And I think I remember that, so uh, Emerson invited Thoreau to come and hang out, right? Well, that's, well, you know, the other thing is that when you come through town, there's the, it's the, you know, we have, a lot of churches in Concord, and um, so all sort of the obvious um, churches. But then the one is less obvious is the is the, um, the Unitarian Church. Yeah. And the Unitarian Church is the one to which it's non-denominational. Non-denominational, um, but where you know it's we people joke it's sort of like the the religion of love. Mm, yeah. I, I yeah. know it's probably will get somebody in, I'll get myself in trouble with somebody on your podcast, but. But it's where all the writers hung out, yeah. basically, and yeah. the and the um, the parish priests who who preached there were also kind yeah. of writers. They kind of started a hippie movement of you know, you know, spa retreats, you know. <laughs> right, right. I guess yeah. you could say that. I mean, there's no question that that um, they were attracted here, yeah. in part because of each other. Yeah, you know, it was, yeah. a, it was a a destination for. And I remember they were complaining like. They didn't get along. Yeah, there's stories that they didn't get along so well. Yeah. I guess you can't, I guess what, what also seems possible, and again, we, I haven't read enough reading about this yeah. to, to be able to say this, but, but um, there was a dialectic between yeah. them. Yeah. So perhaps they made, they didn't like it, but they might have made each other better mm. because of it. Yeah, like a challenging tension. I think the other thing that sort of, that sort of sits in there with American writers, you know, Willa Cather would be another one that you might, you might add yeah. to it, to the, to the group. Um, but it's the sense of like spirit of place, like place yeah, where they were located yeah. um, was imbued in their literature and yeah. in their ideas, yeah. um, you know, what they painted, you, you know, there's like the, the art that they produced had this sort of identity in place. Yeah, it has a geolocator, so it's even good for tourism because now you can go see, oh, this is what he wrote about, you know, he yeah. was writing about this. Well, Gabby, before you leave, um, you have to uh, go for a walk in the cemetery on Authors Ridge. So all these writers are buried one after another in the same place in the cemetery, it's just down, just mm. down the street. So there. this is a writer's town? It's a writer's town. Yeah. So. Do you write? Well, I think that um, the San Petrinos and larger Metro Monterrey families that, that attend uh, ASFM would say that I write a lot. You, you send emails. <laughs> well, I send emails, but I, the, the people started to joke a little bit. I, I think I'd written up, to, I'd written over 50 letters. Okay. Um, articles published in nice. a, uh, to the, to them. I think maybe I have to. I think maybe I'll do less this year. I don't know. I've read some of them. They're really good. I, yeah. I read uh, especially during the pandemic, which we'll get to. Uh, very, very meaningful writing. Well, I, I try to come up with a crazy idea that might catch people's attention. Yeah, I mean, uh, you're, no, com I, you're competing against many distractions. <laughs> I don't know whether writing actually, maybe, I think you might have figured it out. It's that it is, it's a podcast that's maybe better, mm, yeah. maybe easier to consume. Yeah. Um, but you, you got to play to your strengths. And It's interesting so. what can catch people's attention. And it's also a different level of depth. Uh, you, you, you sh I mean, if you catch somebody with uh, enough bandwidth to mm -hmm. read something, mm -hmm. undistracted, mm -hmm. I think that's deeper mm -hmm. than you know somebody listening to their AirPods while mm -hmm. they're washing yeah. dishes. But yeah, but it's hard to get people's full it attention. It became a discipline for me. I would, I, you know, there's always a, a rift on something that's taken place in school, and, and that sort of propels you into whatever the topic is, and you sort of look for, for validation with, with other writers or thinkers to. To help lend some perspective to whatever challenge yeah. we're facing as a local community, yeah. you know, we look for we look for balance, we look for vision, we look for some, you know, some other other person who's maybe thought about it. Yeah. But if we can 
we can validate the way we feel by looking at another uh, writer's experience. And so I tried to do, I tried to kind of connect us to something else yeah. that was bigger than us, yeah. or potentially bigger anyways. Some good precedents and some good ways that people thought about it. Yeah. Certain things. My, I think people got sick of me writing about Cicero. Okay. Um, because uh, I, Cicero, I can't get his exact quote right now, but but um, it basically says that that gratitude is the is the parent of all virtues. It's the okay. it's the it's the it's sort of the, sort of the challenge is, is to think about a, a virtue that is more powerful than being grateful. Um, and, and so I, would ri I rifted on that a lot because I felt like that, that we had sort of suffered a lot as a community and we yeah. had worked really hard to be where, where, where we were getting, but, um, but we had to be grateful for the, for the work and for the sort of the good fortune of being where we are. Yeah. Uh, and so, so I used, I, used uh, I quoted Cicero a lot. <laughs> I think people began to say that, well, you know, oh my gosh, George is going to speak again. He's going to say, say something about Cicero. <laughs> well, you know, one that I read recently is uh, C.S. Lewis. He has an essay about the atomic bomb or a, a little, you know, writing on the atomic bomb. And he was writing, I think in the, you know, mid uh, 20th century. I hope I have it right. Um, he was talking about the the atomic bomb and saying you know if we're gonna get a if, if an atomic bomb is gonna drop upon us uh, don't be terrorized by it you know let it find us dancing and doing sensible things like having conversations with friends and and then somebody sent it to me and, and they just said just replace atomic bomb with COVID, COVID. <laughs> right I think they're right and I, th I thought it was a good way of using yeah. Yeah, past writings to yeah. adapt it to, to yeah. the present time. Well, I think the thing that was so hard about the pandemic is that is the you know lots of things, but one thing is is that it 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 put in stark relief for us. Yeah, our interdependence. Yeah, and and so so you know in some ways I wear a mask to keep you healthy, it's and a lot of people see it the other way around that you wear a mask to. It's sort of a, it's a, it's a individual yeah. thing, but it's really a collective act. Yeah. You know, you do it for that person and that person. You know, and so, and so, struggling with that, um, when most people feel feel like it was a, you know, it was sort of an an, uh, an invasion of, of personal space. It was yeah. an invasion on my on sort of your ability to make decisions for yourself. Yeah. In being enforced from outside, as opposed to seeing it as like, well, it's the, it's. It's my it's my contribution to the health of the collective to do this, and that 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 sort of piece. Um, I think that the our families did a pretty good job of, of understanding. Yeah. But nobody eventually we got tired of it. But it was hard. Like this, it was, that wasn't easy for anybody. Um, That's a social experiment. Uh, it's so interesting because of what you said it's 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 personal, but it has an effect. On the community and the most vulnerable, you know, and but it's not a straightforward argument and because also you need to open schools and you need to open and what's essential and what's not. Right, right. So that's something right. that. And what level of risk are you willing to, to what level of personal risk are you willing to accept, um, in mm -hmm. the you know that serves the larger good and so we want our kids in school so, so. Um, you know, maybe we should accept a certain level of health risk. Yeah. But then how can I define health risk for you, right? Or yeah. health risk for somebody else? Or is the, is the health risk the same for a teacher or for a student? Um, what if you decide you don't want to get vaccinated? Um, is that okay? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, um, it was my decision, but, but, um, but it's my position to keep the collective healthy and so if you're not vaccinated, then you're compromised. So, so there's a lot of, there's also different layers. And now it's easier in the you know, rear view mirror to say, you know, schools should open. Right. But back then, it wasn't. But so you, you moved to Monterrey when? When did you move to Monterrey? Well, I, I got to Monterrey on July 19th. Um, of 
2020? Yeah, so this past fall. 2021? Yeah. When I arrived, they, so, so in, in the fall of, of 2021, school had been closed for 18 months. You know, so you had basically two years of closed school. Um, but so you, one point, and there's sort of gradations of closed, but basically there weren't students on campus. Um, it was all online. Because uh, it started in January 2020, and and so you got there in July 2021. Right, and okay. so at that point, it had been school had been closed for essentially more than 18 months. Really, 18 months is roughly what we'd figure. Okay. And uh, and and people were like, you know, up to here with with no school and. And Monterey yeah. was odd in, well, as opposed to the U.S. because the schools opened earlier in the U.S. and. Maybe in Europe and some Asian countries, like Singapore, it was as long as Monterey. But Monterey was, the schools were closed for a while, longer yeah. than other places. They were closed for a long while, and, and um, I don't really understand the politics of that so well. Yeah. You know, it's interesting too, because, because I think that in some ways you're, if you don't really understand the local politics so well, which of course I didn't, I yeah. just, just moved just, there, yeah. just get there, so I didn't really know. You had no connection to Monterrey. None. So, so, so for me, like in evaluating the risk of opening, objectively, it, objectively, I was like, well, you know, it, there are risks everywhere, but it, but what we do know so far is that that people aren't getting, um, you know, people are getting, people are not getting sick in school. like yeah so so we opened school and of course like at the end of the school day they, they the local authorities closed us and um, I remember that because there was something I don't, know, I don't know what but they closed they, they came and they closed which is all sort of which is and then that actually then parents I thought I was so pleased to see this is that is that parents decided that they they really wanted to have school back um, in person and so so I I was Fortunate and to to um, be able to capitalize on on community interest in having school. So, yeah. so you know, school never would have opened had it not been for parents deciding that they yeah. that it was a non-negotiable for them. That they were going to get school open, and so and so I got to. Well, it affects so many things. You know, first the kids, no school for a year, and I'm sure yeah, you've seen social, a lot of social emotional damage of, of not being having, you know reach out and touch their classmates and yeah. be hugged by a teacher and um, and of course you know the data is still coming in but but zoom school was was not a good it was not good for particularly yeah. elementary school kids yeah. though it's interesting like I you know as we get into this topic is um it's not uniform that zoom school was bad for everybody people yeah. like to say that zoom was bad yeah. for everybody yeah. um, there's no question that for elementary school kids the, in in the aggregate that you can say that it was not not so good for them but there are there are sections of high school kids, older kids, that did very well, and in some in some, some cases, our some of our our kids, um, you know, exceeded expectations, uh, or did did much better in some ways, online, yeah. away from away from um, sort of the social pressures of school. Yeah. One thing that's sort of interesting is that our our sixth graders, for example, our middle school kids, generally, um, sixth, seven, eighth grade grade. Um, came back with stronger liter um, literary skills. They're, they're, uh, in other words, they're much more avid readers than they were than when they left. Okay. So they, so it's interesting. Like they read more um, while away from school, and so they, so they had stronger reading skills when they came back, and we were surprised by that. Yeah, I mean, before the pandemic, math skills in the hand was pretty much uniformly bad everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> that didn't work. On, on it didn't work in Zoom. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I guess there's things, it's, it's interesting, but also we figured out that you don't have to travel necessarily to have a, I mean, this is more in the business world, but to have a meeting, you know, you can have a good meeting over Zoom. Yeah, or yeah. A good conversation over Zoom. Yeah. One to one in particular, so there's two or three or four or five, you know, but, but um, in terms of, you know, the, that Socratic yeah. method of teaching and exchange of ideas and 
um, that's really difficult in Zoom. And, and, uh, and so I, you, you see that one of the latent effects to, to Zoom school and to the pandemic in school now is that, is that students really lost the ability to, to engage with, with class dialogue yeah. in, a, in, a, in an effective way. Like they had, they've, they'd lost the skill set of, of argumentation and, and um, you know, developing a strong argument in a public moment, right? Yeah. Where you're, where I listen to you, mm -hmm. you listen to me, and I come out with a stronger idea because yeah. I've synthesized what you've had to say, yeah. what you've said, and added my information to yours and come out with a stronger argument. Yeah. That dynamic is we've just like really at no level in the school that where students are equipped to have that kind of discussion yeah. when they came back to the classroom. One of the other things I heard is that the math, especially for young kids, you know, mm -hmm. pre-K or mm -hmm. K, mm -hmm. They're learning how to you know, verbally express themselves. You obviously can't read lips, and yeah. uh, that in that could go on for a year. You know that went for a year. Yeah, yeah. And that has an effect too. Yeah, parents are always, I think, got a little, maybe a little grumpy with me on this topic. But you know, by and large, people learned. This will sound silly, yeah. but kids and teachers. You know, there's no question that having facial exp full facial expression was, yeah. we all missed that in yeah, school, yeah. right? But actually, people learn to smile with their eyes. Yeah, and, um, you're right. You learned how to, you're that. And, and actually, the kids were were much more adaptable than their parents. Yep. So the, the parents projected onto their children a lot of their own emotional yeah. distress yeah. about what their children must be suffering. Yeah. When in fact, their children weren't suffering as much as they thought that they were suffering. Yeah, so, no, you're right. They, so, my kids got used to the mask. They wouldn't take it off. You know. Right, so they just got used to it. It became a, you know, it, it just became part of life and yeah. they figured out how to smile through their eyes. Yeah, uh, what an interesting time to be there. Like, the, you got in right in the heat of the moment. <laughs> it's exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, like, I like living in, in uh, Monterrey. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's worked out and I like having the balance of being able to come home too well you know um, I really like being connected to a community yeah um, I like the fact that I'm increasingly getting to know parents yeah and and um, it's really hard by the way in in uh, in Monterrey because yeah. so many people have the same name it's impossible last name or first name it seems like all the same names <laughs> from my perspective really right? From gringo perspective, yeah. from far away. Their old name what? Like, right, they're all their all last names are all Trevinos. Yeah. Um, or Garza. Or Garza, or like, yeah. or then if there's if it's Garza, then they, they and it's they just add another Garza. You have a Garza, you Garza. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so to me, it's, it becomes super confusing. You know, we call each other primos, and your friend's dad or or mom, uncle or aunt. And you know, likewise, they call you sobrino. Yeah. Um, and then, but we never real. I never realized that they were actually uncles <laughs> until we did. A lot of people did the Spanish citizenship through the Sephardite yeah, uh, yeah. law in Spain. Yeah. Yeah. And so I and many people, for the first time, we did our our ancestry. Mm -hmm. uh, in, re in reality, we are cousins. And, you know, yeah. Third, fourth cousins. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, that's really different for me. I think yeah. it's really different for, for most, uh, for North Americans, it's, it's super different. Yeah, because you move more and you're... There's more mo movement, I guess. And, uh, but on the other side, you know, that expression of community yeah. uh, is, is a really neat thing for, my, for Alexander and I to be a part of. And, um, and we feel uh, very well welcomed. That's and, great. Uh, and so I'm enjoying that. I, you know, I look for opportunities to, to, to go out and drink tequila with, with, with parents or play golf. That's my, my current obsession these days. Oh, yeah? To play. Do you, do you play drinking. well? No, no, I'm bad. I'm yeah. super bad. So maybe we can play together if you're bad. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm a pandemic golfer. I, I yeah. picked it up, you know, deep in the pandemic because mm -hmm. it was a way to be, to connect with people. Yeah. And it's the best way to connect. I mean, yeah. actually, my, one of the, the noise in the background is for one of my kids. Yeah. But um, I saw him uh, taking some swings. Yeah, that's Jules. So we started golf together, and you know, he's a lot better than I am. But, but that's yeah. exactly what I want to do with my son. If we play golf, then we have four hours together. Stuck. Yeah, 
Yeah. What, when else yeah. would you have four hours with your well, son? Well, here's my parenting trick. Yeah. Right. How old is your, is your son? Eleven. He's eleven. Wait, no, no, no. Wait, I have a. <laughs> well, you have Christy's more. Gonna, Christy's gonna kill me. I have an eleven-year-old girl and an eight-year-old boy. Okay, so the so I think it's a little different with girls. Yeah. I don't have any experience with. Um, you have only boys. Only two boys. Okay. So so I don't have. I can't. Exp I speak about girls, but um. But if I need to have a serious conversation with one of my children where I want to get information about something or other, I can't sit down and say like, hey, you know, Jules. What's up? What's going on, yeah. dude? Like, you know, I, I see you like suffering about this. He will not stop tell me a thing. You have to do something else. But if I go and play golf with him, he'll tell me everything. If we play football in the back or throw a baseball and have catch, then, um, then I'll get all the information. That's exactly right. <laughs> I have a neighbor that's always playing catch with his sons and he exactly. told me that's when he that's when he figures out everything <laughs> he told me why do you think i play catch i'm like well you like baseball that's the only time my son talks to me and <laughs> that's why we in the u.s play catch because exactly. you talk while you're doing something else yeah yeah it's strange to just talk yeah. like this so with your son you know? my older son nicholas he's much more chatty and he'll he yeah. doesn't he doesn't for him for him he and i go for runs together but my younger one, who's who is in some ways the more traditionally athletically oriented, yeah. um, catch, you know, throw the baseball back yeah. and forth, um, or golf because you're actually walking next to each other yeah. to your ball. Yeah, and you're know, sharing a sport with your kids, mm -hmm. which is not easy mm -hmm. because you have to pick one that they like and then you can handle. <laughs> mm -hmm. I had a friend at work. He used to have you know a new book every month and. They were always like for dummies, like tennis for dummies, or chess for dummies, or um, skiing for dummies. And then I asked him, why do you have these books? He's like, whatever my son is into, I try to get into, <laughs> because that's the only way I'm going to, you know, yeah. have, a, have a relationship. Yeah. I think that one of the ways that, I mean, it's funny, we're sort of in the relationships with yeah. kids. I think that the thing that people sometimes lose sight of in, in um, you know, in developing a relationship with their child is that is that everyday life affords opportunities to develop a relationship with your child? Yeah. Going grocery shopping, you know, helping you here, like helping you mow the lawn, like the the everyday kinds of activities are ones where where relational opportunities exist. Yeah. And I think sometimes we forget, like we think, like, oh, I need to I need to organize a tennis game in order to have a relationship with my child or I need to organize this certain activity in order to have a relationship with my child. And, and my sort of, at, at, I'm in my late 50s now, in my late 50s as a parent, I feel like that, that no, it's not, it's, it's not so much that, it's actually the unorganized. And so how do I, how do I um, you know, do things that are part of regular life yeah. that and make sure I'm trying to use them to engage relationship. That's so um, interesting, uh, because yeah. sometimes we over plan I think I'm making a comment about that. Yeah. yeah. No, I, 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 I share it. Sometimes the best things happen randomly, right? Yeah. It's just you mowing the lawn, your son is you know, taking swings. Yeah. And that's yeah. when yeah. Yeah. You know, a relationship happens. And, and sometimes we're, or I make the mistake of, okay, we got to go, you know, Sundays, we got to go to this and this and this and this. And you're, you don't allow enough boredom or silence mm -hmm. for things to emerge. Mm -hmm. So, Gabby, I have a question for you. All right, so you've chosen to live in Houston. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And where are you from? From Monterrey. You're from Monterrey. Yeah. And your wife, Christine? From Monterrey. Yeah. Also from Monterrey. Yeah. yeah. So, you guys are, are like, you're regios. Yes. Right? And you're living in, in Houston. Houston. Yeah. So, so, that's an interesting thing, right? So, you're, so, so, what are the best parts of being yeah. in San Pedro? Yeah. Or is that actually best? Probably unfair for me to no, say. No, no, we're from San Pedro. San Pedro, but I grew yeah. up there. You know, the, a mile away from Christie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So but there, but there's still like you probably, I don't know, maybe maybe professionally you couldn't, but could you live? Yeah. But but anyways, you've chosen this life. Yeah. And um, and there are things that get sacrificed by choosing to live yeah. in Houston yeah. um, and their advantages of living in, in Houston. So I'm just curious from your perspective and maybe even for your listeners. We've, we've talked about this so much uh -huh. 
uh, but I, I'll try to make it brief. Um, there's a lot of comfort. I'm just wondering whether there's a lesson yeah. in this for me. Th there is. I'm trying to organize so I can say, we, you know, and I ha don't have it figured out, but I can mm. say that a couple of things. There's a lot of comfort from knowing that you come from a place where you have a lineage mm -hmm. and that you, it goes back several generations. I found out 13. Mm -hmm. It's not a lot mm -hmm. because I did my lineage. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of comfort and knowing that that you have roots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That gives you a sense of me a sense of security. It might have some evolutionary mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, meaning mm -hmm. because you know if you're part of the tribe that means that you're protected and mm -hmm. and it can be comfortable, you know, for if you and you have thirteen generations living here, you don't have to necessarily explain you know, you, 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 your last name identifies you for good or bad, you know, yeah, it's just, yeah, you, yeah. that also can be a bit limited, limiting for me because it feels like you're, you cannot necessarily improvise things outside the box, you know, go outside of your lineage necessarily, you have mm -hmm. to stay there. Or can, community expectations, maybe. Yeah, community expectations. And, and then... You know, I went to Houston for work. You know, I studied, I'm a lawyer, and that's where I found my, I didn't plan it. I wasn't planning, hey, I want to live abroad, or like next door. Uh, but something good about Houston, or the US, I think, is the worth ethic and, and discipline, mm -hmm. you know? And for me, there's a good yin yang, mm -hmm. and I need both. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, for me, this is not applicable to everybody, but for me, being in Houston means you go to bed early, you wake up early, you you work hard. And then Monterey means uh, family, means gatherings, means you know a lot of community. Mm -hmm. And I love both. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily the case. I'm sure there's a lot of people that mm -hmm. you know they have it flipped, mm -hmm. uh, and that has worked. And I need a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. I, 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 for me, I think that I had to get out of my cocoon. Mm -hmm to challenge myself a little bit mm -hmm. and and that worked that that made me feel good mm -hmm. I thought that maybe I wouldn't have uh, maybe done that if I had stayed but I don't know mm -hmm. I don't that was a long answer to your question well I think it's I think maybe I have similar interests though um, you know the cocoon maybe metaphor I I want to feel like that's a protective space being yes. in San Pedro yes. and in the larger metro Monterrey. Um, I've been corrected a few times when I say San Pedro because because actually we have many people at school that are in the larger metro region yeah, yeah. of Monterrey yeah. and not necessarily in San Pedro. Yeah. So I try to say both. But the um, the that I want I want that sense of belonging and community. Yeah. That's what I and I feel that there's an opportunity to develop that over time. Yes. So I look forward to that. Um, I get a little frustrated sometimes with with um, with our community because I think that they, you know, there's a little bit they'll they'll sacrifice any they'll sacrifice a lot of their own um, children's academic goals um, in favor of community and yeah. and I think that and I understand that it's a it, there's a tension there for them. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just rip picking up on what you no, just said. No, no, thank you. That's but but there's like there's this tension for our most of our families where their community is so important yeah. that they'll sacrifice yeah. some of the things that are helping their children do some of the things that you just articulated. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and I struggle with that because I so I say to them like, hey, gosh, you know, we have to take greater responsibility. You know, you need to feel like you meet expectations. Even though there's this pressure to to, to embrace community yeah. and community functions, yeah. birthday parties, piñatas, yeah. like you know, um, juevesitos, yeah. you know, these are things that that sometimes stand in the way of what you say you want. And if you say you want that, then there comes with sacrifice, and yeah. and um, and and that's a sort of a space where I at times get frustrated with that. And it's the job. going back to history. I think it's the difference, I don't know if you'll agree, but the difference between the Anglican, Protestant, individualist, individualistic view, mm -hmm. obviously going back to how this country was founded, there were people that being, came being prosecuted from the English church trying to 
you know, come to a place where they were free, but it was based on individualism. Mm -hmm. You know, no more, no more, uh, you know, the church trying to get me or paying taxes to the, to the crown. Yeah. Yeah. I can make it on my own and it was a very individualistic super, Anglican super individualistic and I yeah. think Mexico and Spain and more of the Latin I sort of divide sometimes two philosophies the more Anglican individualistic Protestant view and the more communal Latin you know romantic cultures like Spain that you know I don't think there's a right answer and I don't know if you agree but it's part of the yin yang that I'm talking about. You know, sometimes you have to work hard, and the yeah. only way to work yeah. hard is being alone. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's hard to work hard and you know study. And I've tried studying with friends; it never works. Right. <laughs> well, it, it works. It's a. It's. I, I think that learning is social. Yeah. But when you have to memorize something or you know truly demonstrate full command of, of a certain amount of, yeah. of content eventually solitude grind you you've got to grind right you're gonna just have to like close the doors and focus on that yeah. and then process it in community and socially but there's this there's this solitude piece that's part of learning yeah and I think that's I look think of some of our students they don't actually have any solitude no there and so so I wonder like you know, if you really want to exploit the potential of the life of the mind, then where are you, where are you devoting time to the life of the mind? Yeah. Right? Because life of the mind, in some ways, you do have to shut the doors. Um, and we have uh, Emerson's <laughs> house here, so it's very symbolic, because that's it, what he did. That's <laughs> kind of what he did, and that's what throwed it. But, but at any rate, it's just sort of an interesting topic. It is. Yeah. Uh, and I think, I don't know the answer. Right. Yeah. Because sometimes you also miss the, miss the community part. And they say that Mexico and Spain, they were some of the happiest countries. I don't know how they measure it or if it's even true. They say that Finland is among the happiest countries. Mm -hmm. um, Finland, the North, like Finland, Norway, Sweden yeah. are some of the happiest. And I think that Finland is like the happiest, the happiest school children are in Finland. Is it very they, communal? Well, I, 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 I'm going to rip. I'm gonna riff on the weather because I would think like I'd be much more happier in Monterrey yeah, than yeah. in Finland, but but um, they also have one of the shortest academic days mm -hmm. in Finland, um, and the highest rendimiento, like the highest sort of output of academic results, yeah. are also in Finland. So shortest academic day and highest output. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's it's like dark all winter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't know like how that how, how those things go together but it's, it's, it's interesting. Well, in Mexico we say, you know, somos felices pero no lo sabemos. Yeah. We're happy but we don't know it. And that might be true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We laugh a lot. You yeah. know, one of the good things is uh, humor and that's something that I love about Mexican culture. It is. Humor. Their people are, you know, super good. I am, um, a couple times when I've played golf, we go back and there's like a, we have a drink and hang out. And uh, and the, and people are so darn funny. Yeah. It's like it's a riot. Yeah. And uh, of course, I miss a lot of the jokes in Spanish. I'm getting better. I'm pretty good now. But but um, but then they tell me them again later, so it's okay. <laughs> and I laugh again at the same jokes. So yeah. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you're getting the jokes, then you're doing pretty good. Yeah. No, that's yeah. interesting. And uh, what have you learned? If you can say, you know, how how long have you been in in this role in Monterrey? So I just completed, this was my first um, year, year as a superintendent. And, Do you and have I, some learnings? Uh, we did a lot of, sort of planning and, and soul searching sort of in the, as, a, as, a, as a way of kind of recovering and processing the pandemic. Yeah. And, and so academically, there's no question that, that our school and community needs to work harder, right? And it's, and part of our, and, and a piece of that, a big piece of that is that the pandemic and two year, missing basically two years of school um, was bad for learning. Um, so we're, we're recovering from that. But, but my main learning is that, is that I'm really, we really as a community have to become a little bit more disciplined about our pursuit of our goals. And, um, and so my motto these days is like, and, and, and parents are gonna go crazy because I'm gonna say it so many times, um, but it's like, you know, is take responsibility. Like you have to take responsibility for your own learning, for your own goals, you, 
but you have to take full responsibility for that as an individual, right? As an expression of your, of your individual goals, you have to take responsibility for that. You need to meet expectations. And so what does it look like for a school that insists on meeting expectations? Like you can't get a bad grade. You have to meet expectations. And then, and then the optimistic, let's go someplace, is go beyond. So that's what it is, take responsibility, meet expectations, and go beyond. So, so we wanna help students reach new heights to go beyond, to go beyond what they thought they could do. But to do that, you basically have to make sure you, you are willing to take responsibility for yourself, right? And you're willing to, um, to not allow yourself to not meet expectations. Like meet minimum expectations, yeah. um, and then hey, let's chart um, you know paths that take you way beyond what you thought you could do, but you have to be willing. And so, so basically, like that in a in a nutshell, then it's a little bit like you know, there's some discomfort in learning. Yep. And that I think is something that is hard for our community to kind of wrap their head around. Is there's some fundamental discomfort that comes with pursuing your goals if you have set lofty goals for yourself. And that's true with learning, sports, you know, doing anything. Extraordinary yeah. things. Yeah. Or yeah. It takes a lot of work. Yeah. George, thank you so much. Thanks for yeah. having us in your beautiful yeah, I, house. Yeah, come anytime you want. Actually I, I should also say to if this if this piece gets is that um I'm a lot of um a local uh, you know Monterey families, uh, San Pedro families have come to visit so oh, I really yeah so I the people are dropping in which I think cool. is, which is great awesome so um I we'll know, give everybody the address so they can well I won't do that <laughs> but they all they can all text me anyways <laughs> kidding <laughs> uh we won't yeah. give out your address but this yeah. is beautiful yeah. um yeah. and, and I, I'm sure you get a lot of uh deep thorough like rust here. yeah yeah and, uh, well, good beautiful. job with mowing the lawn. By the yeah, way. thank you. Thank you. I think of natural ability for that. It's the first time I've done it, so I have yeah. a, I have work to do too. <laughs> thank you so much. I can give you lessons in doing that. Yes, please, <laughs> please. Thank you. <laughs>